Okay, now we're going to take a look at the cardiac system. First, we're going to look at uh, the blood flow of the heart. As I walk through this, please read through it on the right-hand side and also look at the depiction of the picture with the arrows so that you'll have a better understanding of how the blood flows through the heart. We know that the heart is a muscle. We also know that the right and left sides of the heart work together. We know that this is a continuous pattern of blood flow through the heart and to the lungs and body that allows the blood flow to continuously um, produce blood through the heart, lungs, and body. And again, it, it is it does this to supply oxygen and nutrients to the body cells and also to help us get rid of waste that is in our body um, so that it doesn't, you know, be, doesn't make our body become toxic. We know from previous anatomy and physiology classes that veins, the veins in our body, usually their normal job is to return blood carrying CO2 and it gets rid of waste, right? The CO2 is what we're breathing off as waste. And usually the arteries are what contains the O2 enriched red blood cells that produce, uh, um, that provide oxygen to our tissues, right? That's what we know general veins and arteries do in the body. However, the blood flow through the heart is a little different. And so just take a look at the right-hand side as we go through and you'll, you'll understand. So we know the right side of the heart, blood enters the heart through two large veins, the inferior and superior vena cava, emptying oxygen-poor blood from the body into the right atrium of the heart. As the atrium contracts, blood flows from your right atrium into your right ventricle through that open tricuspid valve. When the ventricle is full, that tricuspid valve shuts. This prevents blood from flowing backward into the atria while the ventricle contracts. As the ventricle contracts, blood leaves the heart through the pulmonic valve into the pulmonary artery, and then it goes to the lungs where it is oxygenated. Note that oxygen poor or CO2 containing blood goes through the pulmonary artery to the lungs where CO2 is exchanged for O2. Then the blood travels through the pulmonary vein, emptying oxygen-rich blood from the lungs into the left atrium of the heart. As the atrium contracts, blood flows from the left atrium into your left ventricle through the open mitral valve. When the ventricle is full, the mitral valve shuts. Again, this prevents sh uh, blood from flowing backward into the atria while the ventricle contracts. As the ventricle contracts, oxygen-enriched blood leaves the heart through the aortic valve into the aorta and to the arteries and eventually into the veins to complete the blood circulation into your body. And that is how the blood flows through the heart. It's important that you recognize this pattern that you, um, you were able to describe it and so that you can understand when something's going wrong in the body, what exactly is happening. For example, you would understand if you got a deep vein thrombosis in your leg, if that was to break off, then you know it would travel to your lungs, right? Based on the blood flow of the, of the body. So again, it's important that you know this and you're able to recall this information. As a nurse, it will just be second nature. Um, but as a student, just it's important that you memorize it. It's also important just to notice real quick, when I was going through the blood flow of the heart, when it leaves the left atrium, um, the mitral valve is also known as the bicuspid valve. They're interchangeable uh, names. It's the same valve. Um, so if I confused you, I apologize. But the mitral and, and bicuspid valve are both the same uh, valves. Uh, NCLEX usually use mitral valve instead of bicuspid, but just know that they're interchangeable. Um, okay, so we're going to now move on. Again, this just describes how the blood keeps moving forward um, through the body and what each chamber does. Um, we just went through that 
verbatim. So just take a look at this when you're studying and again be able to recall it for any testable information. We know that the SA node is the um, initial pacemaker of the heart, right? And the SA node initiates the heartbeat and this is the impulse that passes through the body and causes an a conduction electrical conduction of the heart so that we have a heartbeat and so that blood can flow through the body. If the SA node um, does not work, it, the, the next backup node is the AV node. So we have the AV node is second. After that, then we have the bundle branches and then finally the um, Purkinje fibers. So, um, so again, we have the SA node. Its normal rate is 60 to 100 beats per minute. The next node is the AV node, which is 40 to 60 beats per minute. And lastly, the ventricles are, they work at less than 40 beats per minute. So needless to say, if we're relying on our ventricles to try to um, keep blood flowing through our body, it's not going to work. It's a poor system um, and it's going to be an emergency for the patient. So looking at the heart wave, we measure the normal intervals between each of the different aspects of the wave of the heart. And we do this because it gives us an idea if something is going wrong in the body if there's an electrolyte imbalance, if the patient's having um, a potential dangerous arrhythmia, if um, they're having a heart attack and so forth. So it's important that we know each of these. We have a P wave, we have a QRS wave, we have a T wave, and we have a U wave. We also look at the intervals, the time and distance between when one occurs and the other occurs. Again, this is so that we understand the morphology and know if there is a variance in there and then we can start looking as to see why this is occurring. The PR interval normal range should be 0 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds. The QRS complex should range from 0 0.06 to 0.12 seconds and the QT interval should range from 0.36 to 0.44 seconds. We know that the P wave represents the right and left atrial depolarization. Look at the pictures below as I go through this. The QRS complex represents ventricular depolarization as well as atrial repolarization. You can see that on the picture. The T segment represents ventricular repolarization. And again, this is important to know because again, if you know the duration, the morphology, the amplitude, what it should look like, how long it should be between each of these, then you will know if something, the patient's having an, um, a potential deadly arrhythmia, if there's um, an electrolyte imbalance that is you know, dangerous to the patient, the patient's having a myocardial infarct or a heart attack and so forth. So it's really important that we do understand and know these um, values. Again, I showed this video in class. It's a really cool video and you, I, I definitely encourage you to look through the different types of um, arrhythmias on that um, website. It's a great uh, visual aid for helping connect the uh, thoughts in your head with, with what's happening in the body. Okay, first, we have to always know what's normal in order to understand what's abnormal in the heart. First, we start with sinus rhythm. This is normal. This is a normal heart rate. All healthy individuals should have this heart rate. We know that the initial impulse is coming from the SA node, the natural pacemaker of the heart. And so that we know that means it's a normal heartbeat um, in respect to heart rate and rhythm. The heart rate again will fall between 60 and 100 beats per minute and the shape of the EKG tracing will exhibit a um, form that's at the top there. It's equal in distance between each of the um, QRS waves 
um, the PT and U waves as well. And you can literally, on the six second strip, you can count and get an estimate of the heart rate based on how many R waves there are, right? We did this in class. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven times 10 is 70. So this is approximately 70 um, beats per minute heart rate. Next, we're gonna take a look at sinus tachycardia. And that's the rhythm at the top. It's important that you um, are able to pick out these rhythms that we're discussing in class. So sinus tachycardia means that the sinus node is firing anywhere between 100 and 180 beats per minute. We see this rhythm with patients anywhere from a patient who's just working out, right? So it's an expected increase in the output or it could be an indicator that the patient's in pain, they're having um, anxiety attack, they could be dehydrating, they could have an infection by, you know, a bacterial or viral infection that they got and they don't even know about and they're spiking a fever. They could be hypovolemic or hyperthermic. Um, they could be anemic. It could be heart failure. They could have a heart attack or MI. It could be that their thyroid is working double time, so they're hyperthyroid. It could be that they have a severe infection throughout their entire body, so they're septic. It could be that they have had a deep vein um, thrombosis break off and travel to the lungs, becoming a pulmonary embolist. Um, it could be that they're drinking caffeine, they're on, um, illegal drugs like cocaine, amphetamines, um, it could be that they're smoking, um, and acute dr drug withdrawal. We see it many, a lot of times with acute drug withdrawal. There's lots of things that could be causing, um, your body to be tachycardic, right? Um, again, it's how we treat it is based on what's going on in the body. If it's something we expect, there's no need to treat it, right? If it's just connected to the fact that we're working out, that's expected. So there's nothing, nothing needs to be um, done. So again, you know, you could have a patient who um, this is a normal outcome. If it's not expected, then we're gonna treat based on what's happening in the body, right? So if the patient is um, dehydrated, then we're gonna give fluids, right? Or if they have they have a fever because they've contracted bacterial pneumonia, then we're gonna treat the underlying infection with antibiotics. Remember that in, your patient can their symptoms can range anywhere from being totally asymptomatic, meaning they're not displaying any symptoms at all, to the other extreme, which is severe shortness of breath, rapid pulse rate, rapid heart palpitations, chest pain, and they could even faint um, on you. So just be real careful, and, and we're going to uh, monitor these patients closely when they are symptomatic. If we, how do we treat ST? Again, um, sinus tachycardia is if it's related to, um, you know, stress or anxiety, we can teach them how to vagal, um, and this will automatically drop their heart rate. So when you bear down, like to have a child or to have a bowel movement that causes your body to vagal and, and have your heart rate drop, or, or if it is a, um, related to heart failure or you've had a heart attack in MI, then we're going to put you on the appropriate medications, um, antiarrhythmics, beta blockers. We might do cardioversion if it's um, AFib. Um, we might do catheter ablation, pacemakers. Pacemakers are typically used when your heart's not pacing and beating appropriately. So that's usually seen when, when we're Brady, so lower. But sometimes we do use it when, when you're tacky, when patients are tacky. But the majority of times, just to give you a heads up, you're going to see it in the real world when the patients are bradycardic. Um, if the patient needs a cardioverter implanted in them, we can do that. And then we might need to do surgery. Um, 
for the patient to fix the problem. So once again, it's determining what exactly is the cause and then treating the underlying cause. Next one we're gonna look at is sinus brady, and that rhythm is above there. Um, this means that the patient's heart rate is less than 60 beats per minute. Causes of sinus brady include, it could be simply aging. As we get older, uh, heart rate slows down. Or it could be that we've had coronary artery disease. We could have had um, MI. It could be an infection, endocarditis or myocarditis. Again, it could be that we're having hypothyroidism or it could be an electrolyte imbalance. And also medications can also cause a patient to be bradycardic. Remember, for example, beta blockers are used to manage patients' blood pressure to decrease it, but they also decrease the heart rate. So this definitely, if you're taking a beta blocker, it could cause your heart rate to drop below 60 beats per minute. Antiarrhythmics or digoxin as well. We need to keep a close eye on patients taking any of these medications, right? We know the impulse again is coming from the SA node, the natural pacemaker of the heart. So your, your patient may be anywhere from asymptomatic. Remember in, in class, I talked about how my, my mom is naturally, her heart rate is naturally less than 60 beats per minute. It's normal for her. So again, finding out what's the patient's baseline, that's always important to know. So um, it could be anywhere from asymptomatic to the complete opposite where we have patients having syncope episodes because their um, heart rate is dropping so low. So you got to look for everything in between. Weak, weakness, fatigue, shortness of breath, confusion. So the neuro, neuro changes are occurring. Um, they could be um, near fainting, um, chest pain, all, all of it. Uh, we treat it again based on anywhere from just monitoring your patient. If it's just slightly bradycardic, we might just you know monitor the patient. Or if it's severely bradycardic, again, remember we just mentioned that you would most likely have the patient have to have an implanted pacemaker so that the heart could be paced so that it um, perfuses the, the body with the appropriate amount of uh, blood to the organs. We also could, if, if it's related to an intermediate, like a electrolyte issue, then we might um, just give the patient atropine to get them through the episode of the electrolyte imbalance. And then when the patient's electrolytes are aligned, then we can take them off the atropine and the heart rate should go back to within a normal range of 60 to 100 beats per minute. How does atropine work in the body? So with all of the medications for the entire block, it's important that you understand how they work in the body so that when a patient is reluctant to take it, you can explain what's happening with the disease process as well as how that medication will help with that disease process. So atropine is an anticholinergic drug and it literally increases the firing of that natural pacemaker, the SA node, and it does this by blocking the action of the vagus nerve on the heart. And by blocking the vagus nerve, this results in an increased heart rate. So it's, um, you see that it's very effective for in a patient who is in sinus bradyc bradycardia. Next, we're going to look at atrial fibrillation and the um, EKG or ECG strip is above. Uh, based on the name, what do you know about this rhythm, atrial fibrillation? Well, it means that it's quivering, right? The um, the fibrillation, literally, if you break down that word, that means that the the um, the heart is quivering. So we have this irregular quivering arrhythmia, and we talked about that with the SA node firing rapidly and sporadic without any kind of rhyme or reason. It's sending these signals so fast that the um, 
the body's not able to catch up with it, right? So it's firing all these um, signals from the SA node and the heart's working triple time trying to keep up with it. As a result, we have blood pooling and this puts us at a much higher risk of getting blood clots, which can travel and become travel and can become strokes, can cause heart failure, can cause all kinds of problems within the body. Um, so even though it is, you know, the the electrical conductivity is coming from the SA node, which is, you know, the natural pacemaker of the heart. So it's coming from the right place. It's just doing it ineffectively. Too many impulses rapidly firing at once, causing a very chaotic rhythm that the body and heart cannot keep up with. This chaos causes that blood to pool and sit there. And we know that anytime blood sits, it starts to form a clot, right? So it sits there and the ventricles aren't able to effectively squeeze it through. And then when it does, it could send a blood clot through. So that blood pooling is very, very risky. Um, and it puts us at a much higher risk for strokes. Again, the heart rhythm or heart rate is going to be uh, between 100 and 175 beats per minute. Um, no, it is not a normal heart rhythm. Um, we see this heart rhythm with patients who have had um, heart attacks, who have chronic heart failure um, or chronic heart disease. Sometimes there's a genetic link for, for families to get atrial fibrillation. Some patients who have hypertension uh, will get this underlying um, arrhythmia. Um, some diabetes mellitus patients will get it. Patients who have thyroid problems. Some who drink large amounts of alcohol or smoke have been smoking for years and have ended up with some type of chronic lung, dis lung disease like COPD. So there's a wide range of reasons why patients will get atrial fibrillation. And we do know that this um, abnormal rhythm, patients will, can be anywhere from asymptomatic to very short of breath, very diaphoretic, very dizzy, very, you know, they're very fatigued and anxious because they're not able to catch their breath and, and recover from it. So again, it can be totally asymptomatic, especially if they have their heart rate within their normal rhythm, right? So if you have a patient who's got a heart rate within a, a normal rhythm at the time, um, we'll see this in the hospital when we're taking care of our atrial fibrillation patients, right? Heart rate, you know, 60 to 100 beats per minute. That's not you know, that's not uh, treatable. We'll just monitor them at that point. Um, but if, of course, if it's higher, then we're going to intervene and um, treat with medications. And if medications don't work, then we're going to, we could go in and we could um, cardiovert them, which is, it's a timed um, shock with the heart rhythm. And it's, uh, to give the SA node the opportunity to start over. And the usually the SA node will start over with a regular rhythm. So we do car we schedule cardioversions all the time for patients who have atrial fibrillation. But if a patient keeps popping into that um, a a AFib um, after they've been cardioverted, then patients may opt to have surgery where they go in and they do an ablation, which is they produce a really cold amount into the heart and it kills part of the tissue that caught that is causing the extra sporadic um, chaos of the rhythms. And so they may need surgery ultimately down the road. They may opt for that. The next rhythm we're going to look at is ventricular tachycardia. This patient is trying to code on you. This is a very serious um, rhythm for a patient to be at. So they cannot sustain this for a long time. We see this occur. Um, patients may be on the cardiac floor and you might be monitoring them um, and they might be having some PVCs. We talked about this in class. Um, where 
you know, and occasionally they'll be throwing an extra PVC in their rhythm. And these um, ventricular contractions, these preventricular contractions can be causing, you know, it can be a, a risk for the patient to go into this permanent ventricular tachycardic rate. So we're going to be watching patients who are throwing PVCs so that they don't go into what we call a, a run of VTAC. The longer the run, the more likely that VTAC will become the patient's continuous rhythm. So again, we're going to be watching them very closely. Remember that the ventricular rate is, is above 100. And we'll see, look on the left-hand side, a regular to slightly irregular rhythm. Obviously, it's larger, right? The amplitude is larger on, on the um, EKG strip. And then if they go into ventricular tachycardia, you can see there on the right-hand side of that strip where you know you only have seconds to respond, right? Seconds to maybe a minute or two. Causes of ventricular tachycardia include electrolyte imbalances, drug toxicity, or the patient being hy hypoxic. Um, this is ventricular or VTAC is the most common cause of sudden uh, cardiac deaths with patients. And your patient will present many times asymptomatic, especially if they're not in, um, if they're in a short run, like if they only have, if they're throwing PVCs, you, you they will not be showing s symptoms usually if they're just, they have a PVC here and there. Now, as soon as they go into a permanent rhythm of VTAC, you're definitely going to see um, the patient respond. Um, and it, it will lead to syncope and death very quickly. So um, if we ever see a patient convert to a, this rhythm, then we will be administering adenosine. Um, please know that medication really well, and as well as lidocaine. Um, they're anti-dysrhythmics, so that we can potentially resolve this dysrhythmia. The next one we're going to look at is ventricular fibrillation. This is definitely a medical emergency. As you can see, there's absolutely at that strip. Look at the strip. There's no rhyme or reason to it. This is literally the ventricles are just quivering. Um, the patient's got one foot in the grave and their heart, the heart is trying to stop on you. This usually happens because the patient's had an MI. Um, so the heart has not been getting oxygen and this is just the next step of that MI. Um, and then the patient will die if we don't correct it. Go in. If the patient has an MI, we have to figure out what's the underlying cause of that um, myocardial ischemia. So usually it's due to some type of blockage, and we'll rush them in to see where that um, plaque has built up and, and try to fix that problem. Maybe we'll have to do a cabbage. We're going to talk about that later on. Um, or this could be an arrhythmia that has that we missed that we didn't treat so untreated VTAC will go into VFib rather quickly so keep that in mind we have to correct these arrhythmias as quickly as possible could be due also to an electrolyte imbalance as well as dig toxicity remember digoxin the medication has a therapeutic level that's why we're monitoring patients who are on dig really closely making sure that they don't become toxic and cause the patient to go into a, a, an arrhythmic like V-fib and then die. Um, your patients are going to usually be unconscious, have poor to no cardiac output. Um, it'd be very difficult, no pulse, um, BP and respirations. You know, like I said, the, the, the ventricles are just fibrillating. That's all you got. Um, so remember time is tissue death. So the more time that the patient's body is without oxygen and um, output, the more brain tissue, heart tissue death is happening. And remember, this is non-reversible, right? We're losing tissue that we can't get back. Again, it's a medical and emergency. We're going to start CPR and defibrillation, uh, giving the patient amiodarone, epi, epinephrine, lidocaine, may additionally add, add beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, etc., to get this rhythm back to a normal rhythm. 
Remember that best results if we start CPR within the first 30 seconds of a patient going into this rhythm, okay? So it's important the sooner we respond, the less tissue death and the likelihood that we can reverse this and save the patient's life. You notice that cardiac clues, if something's not going right with the heart, we can see it from head to toe. So our hair will, your patients will present with brittle, dry, th um, thin, very poorly nutritional um, output of hair. It'll, you can literally see the scalp sometimes because the hair is so thin. Um, and this is usually, you know, due again to the cardiac insufficiency and vascular insufficiency. So the hair is really thin. And so you can see that scalp. Again, with the eyes, remember we talked in class about how the eyes, the vessels behind there are so small and they're, so they're easily um, destroyed and easily impacted when, when there's pressure put on the vascular system, right? So it's important that if we have those vascular changes, like an increased BP, this can cause permanent damage to those vessels in the eyes and you'll start to see, um, get blurry vision and start to have, you know, loss of eyesight. So it's important that we watch that. Um, we're also going to be looking at the, um, the eyelids, um, because we can, many times you can, um, a doctor can see that there's a cholesterol problem by looking closely at the eyelids. They'll in, end up having some raised yellow orange plaque under the eyelids and it's visible. Um, we can actually see it sometimes too with your patients when they're really, really toxic with cholesterol um, in their arteries. Then also with your lips and tongue, you know, if you think about cyanosis, you'll see that it's, you know, the mucosa will be dry. Um, and then there might be a graying or blue color to it. They'll be cyanotic. Jugular veins can be distended. Um, when you put the client at a 45 degree angle, right, you shouldn't see that jugular vein. But if we do, that could be a very big indicator that the patient's blood pressure is raging and then it's um, there's a hypovolemic problem right this can lead to right-sided heart failure tamponade and um, it also could be um, a cause of pericarditis as well we're going to listen to the lungs for sure right because if patients are having problems with their heart then we m we will typically hear crackles um, or we're going to also put them on a cardiac monitor and then we're going to look for those rhythmic, you know, those arrhythmias, right? Additionally, we can hear murmurs if they're, if the patient has a heart murmur, um, when we listen with our stethoscope and listen to the heart, right? You can hear those murmurs in there. Take blood pressure is a very good indicator, um, of cardiac health. So anybody over 140 over 90, um, we know with the new guidelines would be hypertensive. We're going to take a look at fluid accumulation either in, in the abdomen, on the sacral area, in the lower extremities, ankles and feet and legs. The skin, if it's dry um, and has a blue tinge color to it, like cyanosis or poor pallor, um, then it can be indicative of poor circulation, right? That's usually the case. Um, clubbing of the nails, we talked about that. That's a chronic condition, a long time of lack of oxygenation to the tissues. Um, and that definitely could be because the cardiac's not um, circulating the blood throughout the body, right? It definitely could be a cardiac issue. We already studied respiratory, so we know that it also could be a pulmonary issue as well. Um, additional to the uh, clubbing of the nails, you'll start to see their your, the nails will become really thick. Um, and, and then, uh, it's just indicative of that O2, lack of O2 impair throughout the body. Okay, moving on to coronary artery disease. We're going to take a look in block two at atherosclerosis, arteriosclerosis, Stable angina or angina and unstable angina. 
Treatments and Prevention of Coronary Artery Disease. Coronary artery disease includes both, again, atherosclerosis, which is thinning of the vessel wall due to that plaque buildup. You can see that in the picture there, right? The plaque builds up there um, in the vessel causing blood flow impediment. And then arteriosclerosis, this literally the vascular system, um, the cardiovascular system has um, raged, the blood pressure has raged so hard that it has caused the arteries to develop areas where the thinning of the inner wall of the artery and it becomes hard, brittle, and thickened. So because it becomes thickened, the blood doesn't flow very well through there as well. So they're both blood impediment based on different reasons. Um, so obviously how we treat that is different. And we're going to get into that. Coronary artery disease risk factors include, um, obviously, if you have a family history, it does run, there is a genetic link. As we get older, um, we're at a higher risk of getting it. Patients who smoke are at a much, much higher risk of getting CAD. Patients who have diabetes mellitus, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, obese patients or patients who have a sedentary lifestyle. So we're going to encourage um, working out and making better, um, you know, um, food choices and, and dinner choices, breakfast, dinner, etc. Patients who are type A individuals, meaning they have to have everything perfect and just as so it causes a lot of stress in their life. They are at a higher risk for coronary artery disease. And then birth control has a minor elevation in, in a risk for CAD. Um, so again, patients who have CAD, we're going to treat the underlying cause. If the coronary artery disease is plaque related, um, atherosclerosis, we're going to put them on um, an anti-lipid medication and um, that way that we can intervene with the amount of plaque that's being created in the body or that's being um, by our you know food choices we're actually putting into our body um, if it is genetically being created the plaque is being genetically created it's an Due to that family history, then again they're going to go on on um, on a statin, right, for for lipids to decrease the production of the lipids. Um, if it's smoking, we're going to tell them to stop smoking completely. Diabetes, we're going to get their blood sugar under control, which will help with um, the. Um, body's inability to process that excess glucose that's very, very hard on, on the arteries and the body in general. If they're, if it's arteriosclerosis, then we're going to get the patient's hypertension under control. That in and of itself will help um, eliminate the, you know, that artery um, damage. So we're going to start educating them to lose weight, work out better, you know, work out, um, get up and move around more, decrease the stress in your life, um, stop smoking, realize if you have a family history that you probably will have to be on a statin medication the rest of your life to produce, I mean, to help um, control that amount of production of um, lipids in the body. And then just be aware of the risk for birth control. Next, we're moving on to stable angina. This is a cramping or choking feeling in the chest due to lack of O2. And this we know is the most common cause of stable angina is atherosclerosis, that plaque we just talked about. So that plaque builds up in the arteries impeding the blood flow so that when we do something that taxis our heart and causes our blood to need to flow quicker because of that impediment it causes that um, chest pain to happen so with stable angina the 
we know that it's episodic, meaning it's connected to something that the patient's doing, right? So they can pre-medicate for, for these episodes, and that's exactly what we tell them to do. So if the patient gets stable angina when they walk to their mailbox, we're going to tell them to take nitroglycerin before they head to the mailbox, right? Um, so we're going to actually pre-medicate for that stressful on the body situation um, so that it can bring relief and not um, bring on a angina advent with their heart so that they don't have to go through that uh, chest pain due to that lack of O2 because it's very it's painful for them. Unstable angina will be discussed really in block three and four more in detail. Um, but unstable angina, it's unpredictable. There's no way to pre-medicate for it. Um, pain may not always be present, especially in women. If women have um, an unstable angina event, um, it's many times without, with minor symptoms, right? Nausea and um, maybe lightheadedness. But we do know that unstable angina is m more serious than stable angina, much more serious. So again, the, we'll, we'll be discussing more about unstable angina in uh, block three. So what do we do? We said we pre-medicate for stable angina. Well, we're going to take nitroglycerin prophylactically prior to the activity that's causing um, that angina. So we're going to take the nitro sublingual. We're, we're going to advise the patient that they can take one pill and if the pain is not relieved with that one dose after five minutes they can take a second dose and then again they're going to wait another five minutes and if pain still exists they can take a third dose after that third dose though if pain still exists they need to either call 911 and go to the hospital or they need to have somebody drive them. They cannot drive themselves to the hospital. But they knew they do need to get to the hospital because we're not sure if they're still having a stable um, angina event or this maybe is an unstable angina event and they're actually having a, you know, a heart attack, an MI event. Um, again, we are going to tell the patient to store the nitro, nitro in the bottle that it comes in. It's a dark, 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 dark brown bottle. And it's, um, um, we were going to tell them to keep it in a dry place, not in the fridge, but just keep in a cool, dry place in the home away from lights. So because the light degrades the medication and it will not work when they need it to work. St um, stable angina is a lifelong treatment. Um, they have this reduced cardiac um need for O2 because of that impediment typically from the arthrosclerosis, that plaque. So because they they don't have as much cardiac output that a patient would have that doesn't have that plaque buildup, we know that um, they're going to need to be treated, you know, f lifelong or until they get, if it's plaque related, until they get treated for that plaque. We're going to talk about treatments for plaque later on in this lecture. We're going to tell the patient to stop smoking if they're smoking. If they're working out and that's what's bringing on the stable angina, we're going to tell them to not work out as strenuous, right? Take it easier on themselves. If stress is bringing it on, we're going to encourage them to take classes that will help them deal with stress. You know, they could take yoga or take some kind of, sometimes swimming helps with relaxing patients, um, getting some counseling, getting um, essential oils that help sometimes. And we're also going to educate them that sometimes exposure to extreme temperatures can cause it. So we need we need them to be aware of that. So if they walk from um, a hot to cold environment, it can bring that on. Or warm to cold environment, it can bring on a stable angina attack. Um, the physician will most likely start an aspirin protocol for patients who have stable angina. And then also um, any, another medication to decrease the workload of the heart, um, like cardizem or low presser, for example. 
Here's a chart that explains how the patient can describe the chest pain to you as the nurse so that you're documenting and able to quantify to the physician so that we can keep track of um, the severity, radiation, the location, how how it's described as far as morphology. Is it crushing? Is it stabbing? Is it vice-like, which would be very indicative of a heart attack, right? Um, is um, So we're going to see if there are any symptoms that are associated with the chest pain. Are they sweating? Are they pale and gray? When we connect them to um, an EKG or ECG, are they having, um, are they skipping beats? Or is it, um, is their heart racing? Um, are they asymptomatic or are they very symptomatic? Meaning, do they have no symptoms at all? Or are they very short of breath, dizzy, anxious, and ready to pass out on you, right? And nauseous and vomiting. If we have a patient who has a blockage, we are going to offer them multiple, the physician will offer them multiple treatment options. Now, if it's, if the blockage is not severe enough and we can actually get in there and um, do a um, repair so that we can unblock that vessel, we definitely will do that. Um, if we can't get in between that plaque, in other words, if the plaque has built up so thick in that artery, then we will literally have to create another route for the blood flow to, to go. And that would require a cabbage or a coronary artery bypass graft. Um, so again, our options are if we can do an angioplasty or a PTCA percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty, we will definitely prefer to do that um, first. It's surgical repair of unblocking that blood vessel, which would keep that blood vessel, and then the blood could flow through the heart that way. Um, and if not, if it's too large, we can't do an angioplasty, then um, we're going to do a cabbage. And that is, we take a um, artery, a blood vessel from usually the leg and we graft it to provide a bypass for the blood to go through. So again, we either take a vein or artery from the leg and we use it in the chest to provide a new passage for blood to go through. We just bypass literally that blocked um, artery. And then with the angioplasty, sometimes once we clean out that artery, we'll put a stent in place so that we can keep that area open. Um, so we can either do the PTCA, right, which is on the left-hand side here, which is we put the balloon in between the two, we inflate the balloon, and it squishes that plaque. A lot of that plaque will disintegrate and go through and then be processed by the body, getting rid of excrete it out and then it'll just leave a little bit up against the walls of the artery or we'll have to go in and put a stint in place to keep that plaque push that plaque up and keep it out of the way this is how small those stents are they're pretty tiny okay moving on to the per peripheral vascular cardiac system we're going to look at hypertension as well as vascular assessment we know that hypertension is considered the silent killer that's because many patients who have hypertension don't even know it until they go to their doctor um, for their well checks, you know, their annual checks, and they find out that they that they have hypertension. Then they didn't even, they weren't even aware. So primary hypertension is considered what we call essential hypertension. Ninety-five percent of patients have this type of um, hypertension, and it's from an un unidentifiable cause. Secondary hypertension, that's the other 5%, and this is usually due secondary to like renal disease. Um, it can be uh, pregnancy-induced, PIH, pregnancy-induced hypertension, or it could be due to a patient having sleep apnea. Um, we know that approximately one-third of the adult population has hypertension here in the U.S. 46% um, do not have it under control. And the highest prevalence is among African-Americans, 
just because they're at a higher genetic predisposition for hypertension um, as you learn less walk. Usually, again, it's called a silent killer because there's no symptoms other than an elevated blood pressure. And if we're not taking our blood pressure at home, we have no idea that it's elevated, right? Since it's asymptomatic other than that. Over time though, it does cause organ damage or can cause organ damage um, after years of having hypertension. And this would include, again, the eye changes because of the small vessels in the retinal area. Um, renal damage, um, it can lead to a myocardial infarct or an MI, um, especially if the, um, the hypertension is caused by the plaque buildup, right? That definitely can lead to a patient having an MI. Um, or if it's due to a, um, the hypertension leads the patient into a, a, um, an arrhythmia that can be, um, it could be, a sh that could lead it into a stroke. Um, hypertension can cause this patient to stroke out and it can also cause hypertrophy for sure because the, the heart's having to work harder. Remember hypertension was just re defined and the measures were lowered approximately two years ago and so now it is defined as a systolic of above 140 or a sustained diastolic above 90 and this is based on two or more readings on different occasions within three months again the systolic pressure measures the contraction of the left ventricle pressure. This is when your heart is active and pumping blood. And um, so it refers to the amount of pressure in your arteries during contraction. Remember contraction of your heart. Diastolic measures the heart when it's at rest, right? This is when your blood pressure is between beats and it's supposed to be resting. So if if that lower number, that diastolic number is high, then that's that's really, really um, nervous and scary because that's when your heart's supposed to be resting in between beats. So you do need to know the different stages of uh, the blood pressure scale. Normal again is um, systolic less than 120, diastolic less than 80. Elevated, if your systolic is 120 to 129 and your diastolic is, um, it still can be less than 80. You're still considered to be ele elevated. Hypertension stage one, having high blood pressure would be systolic 130 to 139 or diastolic from 80 to 89. Hypertension stage two, blood, high blood pressure would be 140 or higher systolic or diastolic 90 or higher and then you literally are in a hypertensive crisis if your systolic is higher than 180 or your diastolic is higher than 120. Remember the silent killer hypertension usually presents without symptoms or asymptomatic unless there are other organs involved like the kidneys or you're having vascular problems or endocrine problems, or there's a genetic connection. So again, late stages, we start to see it with um, the vessels in the eyes, with the blurred vision. Um, we might see patients neurologically will have a severe headache. That's a very, very big indicator that the blood pressure is in a hypertensive crisis, a severe headache, especially if they're on a hypertensive medication to control their hypertension and they stop it abruptly, right? So they get that rebound hypertension. Those headaches are so severe and it's very scary and can be very life-threatening for a patient to stop their hypertension meds abruptly. They, we have to educate them not to do that. That's very, very risky. Um, hypertension over time causes, again, secondary issues with all of our organs in our body. Um, and then also we want to tell them to avoid alcohol, um, stress, and lose weight, and control the amount of um, bad, um, like cholesterol foods that we're eating. 
and if you have a genetic predisposition, take a look at that and get on a statin right away so that we can control the amount of of uh, poor lipids coming into, you know, that the body's producing. And then, of course, over-the-counter medications, we're always taking a look at that, um, how that intervenes with, they, um, we know that over-the-counter medications can intervene with our treatment of patients with our hypertension medication. So it's important that patients know that. They don't know that, so we have to educate them on that. Um, Again, major risk factors for hypertension include smoking, obesity, physical inactivity, if they have lipidemia, diabetes mellitus, if they're having microalbuminuria, sorry. As they age, as, pe as we age, we are at a higher risk, of course, as we get older, we know that we um, our arteries have been um, working our entire life, right? And we're at a higher risk for getting hypertension because of age. And then, of course, family history. We're going to definitely take a look at that based on genetics. Bring that information that you learned in block one forward. You got a really good baseline for um, cardiac and um, we're going to just add to that this block. And then again, how do we treat it? We're going to encourage them to lose weight eat a healthy diet that's low in fat, low in sodium, that um, is low in alcohol or absent of alcohol, no smoking. So we're going to tell them to completely stop smoking. We want them to start coming up with a regular um, exercise regimen and we're going to teach them relaxation techniques, right? We got to get rid of that stress. Medications that you need to know are listed on the last two um, screens of this PowerPoint, and we'll get there shortly, um, but it's important that we teach the client again about all about their medications, what they're doing in the body, what the safe dosage is, what the severe side effects are that they need to be aware of and the family needs to be aware of so that if they see these side effects, they can get to their doctor right away so that the doctor can make a decision on whether or not to change their medications, right? <clears throat> as well as what they're supposed to see. So if they start a diuretic, they're not surprised that they're having to urinate, you know, twice as much or even three times as much initially in the beginning um, so that they don't think that the medication's hurting their kidneys, right? So we're going to educate them about their meds. It's important. Um, next, we're going to look at the venous disorders, specifically thrombophlebitis. This is break down the word, it's the inflammation of the vein uh, due to a formation of a thrombus. We see this more common in women as we get older, uh, but of course it's seen in both men and women. It's just more common in women as we age. And we also see it in patients that have what's called a hypercoagulability problem. So their blood's clotting more frequently. Also, um, when we have post-operative patients, right, because they're bed bound and depending upon how long the surgery was, they were laying flat most likely for the surgery. So they're definitely at a higher risk for that thrombophlebitis due to, um, you know, being a surgical patient. So we're going to be watching those post-operative patients very closely. And then of course, patients who have had a MI or heart attack, um, post-op, we're going to be watching them for, for the thrombophlebitis. So if a patient has what we call a superficial thrombus, that means that it's barely on the outer layer of, of the, the vein itself, um, then we're going to just elevate the extremity and apply a warm compress for comfort measures, right? It's not deep. There's no risk of it breaking off and traveling and becoming a more serious problem. It's superficial. However, if they have a deep vein thrombosis, right, and they're showing signs of um, well, a deep vein thrombosis can be anywhere from totally asymptomatic, patients can have them and not even know it, to the classic signs and symptoms of the, there's, you know, the limb where the, the thrombosis is at, typically in a dependent area. That's why we see them mostly in the legs, but they can be anywhere in the body, right? Depending upon where the, the blood pools. 
um, you'll see the area will swell up, right? It may be warm to the touch, red, and it could be painful, right? That These are all signs that can be present. The biggest risk for a deep vein thrombosis is that to break free and travel to the lungs and, and become a, what we call a pulmonary embolist, right? Pulmonary embolists are life-threatening. They, If they block a main branch of the lung, it can prevent the patient um, from exchanging oxygen and therefore be life limiting. It can cause a, their death. Um, we are still, NCLEX is still touching, testing on the positive home sign, so it's important that you know that. Again, warmth, redness, tender, increased circumference, almost always they all have an increased circumference, right, because of the blood clot that's formed in there. You diagnose it with a Doppler test, right? And then once it's been diagnosed with that Doppler test, then we're going to give the patient, they're going to be put on bed rest. We do not want them walking around and having that DVT break loose and become a PE. So we're going to put them on bed rest. We're going to elevate the limb. We're going to put compression stockings on to prevent that one from breaking loose as well as others because they're on bed rest now, right? So they're at a higher risk for getting additional blood clots. And we're gonna put them on anticoagulants to help with any future blood clots. But the anticoagulants, remember, doesn't get rid of the existing clot. And if the blood clot, the DVT, is at a, a really high risk of breaking loose, then the patient may opt with the doctor's recommendation to go in and do a thrombectomy where they go in and try to remove the blood clot. Okay, and now the final two screens are the medications that you need to know, understand really, really well for the exam. So diuretics would include furosemide, uh, spirolactalone, and hydrochlorothiazide. Beta blockers would include metoprolol and atenolol. ACE inhibitors would include lisinopril and captopril. ARBs, losartan and valsartan. Calcium channel blockers, diltiazam and amlidipine. Antianginals would include nitroglycerin. And then um, the beta blockers that we listed above. And then, of course, the calcium channel blockers that we listed above. When, when, they, when we do an antianginal regimen, we usually do more than one medication. We'll do nitro and a beta blocker or nitro and a calcium channel blocker. Also, anti-lipidemics, so statins that we talked about earlier, specifically for block 2, atorvastatin. Coagulation modifiers, so anticoagulants like warfarin and heparin or also thrombolytics like TPA. TPA is a blood uh, clot dissolver. So it's a tissue plasmogen activator and it causes the blood clot to dissipate. Now we're very, very careful. Physicians are in prescribing thrombolytics because Think about it. If we have a medication in our body that prevents us from producing clots, um, our patient is at very high risk of having bleeding out, right? So they're really careful with recommending thrombolytics in very specific situations. They may recommend that, uh, but not usually uh, for a DVT. And then of course, antiplatelets like aspirin and clopidogrel. Alpha, beta, adrenic agonists like epinephrine, you definitely, need, you definitely need to know epi really well. Antiarrhythmics like lidocaine and amiodarone, know those really well. Um, digoxin, definitely need to know that. Anticholinergic, we talked about it, atropine earlier for bradycardic patients. And vasopressors or vasopressin, um, know that one too. All right, so that wraps up cardiac and on to the next topic. I hope you have a good day.